Welcome into this Five Clubs Conversation. I'm Gary Williams. Our Masters Previews. Today, we focus on design. Augusta National Golf Club, when it was created by Dr. Alistair McKenzie and Bob Jones, people were going, my gosh, what is this going to be? Well, somebody who knows what Alistair McKenzie intended to do there, but really wanted to do on all of his designs. Of course, Five Clubs contributor Gil Hance. His thoughts coming up right now on the design of the golf course, the things that stand up even today, almost 100 years later. All that on our design preview special of the Masters right now. Split second, your hands make all the difference. It was time for a grip to help them own the moment. Introducing Reverse Taper, technology to stabilize both hands for a more square putter face at impact. The most important split second in golf. Reverse Taper, only from Golf Pride. Respect the grip. And with that, we welcome him in from his office. His office is mobile. Uh, Gil, how are you, my friend? I'm doing great, Gary. Yeah, it definitely is mobile. It's stationary right now, but it was mobile about five minutes ago. <laughs> I, I, seriously, uh, is there any place that you are more comfortable? Uh, no. Well, I mean, yeah, around family. No, and no, stuff I'm like talking that. about work. Yeah, the yeah, work environment, work. is that your favorite place? 100%. There's no doubt about it. Uh, yeah, this the solidarity, just being in here by yourself, listening to music, shaping, creating. It's uh, it's a special place. All right. Um, you know, we did this last year with you to get your thoughts on Augusta National. I think for people who haven't seen that show, they should watch it. And we're not revisiting the same things, but but to get you to talk about somebody who, among a handful of people, really – kind of set the course for design of golf courses in this country and that is Alistair McKenzie do you remember the first time you went to Augusta National uh yes it was uh the year Ian Woosnam won can't remember 1991 there you go yep that that's was the first, the first time. year I was there oh really yes <laughs> we share that in common yes Wow. Now, do you remember, did you go with friends? What, what, what? Yeah, I went with a, a really good friend of mine, uh, Gary Jager, who's, uh, we went to high school together and his parents lived in Aiken. Um, so we were down there visiting them and him and we went out and it was, yeah, it was great. I still actually have a photo of the two of us in front of the big master scoreboard. It's in my office. So uh, yeah, it was a special day. That, that is cool. So you were just there one day? Just there that one day. Okay. Yeah, I think it was there. Okay, so so were there were there things that you intended to see that you wanted to see in particular, uh, and if not, what about the golf course kind of struck you that day? Uh, I mean, the beauty of it, obviously, and you know, it's trite now. Everybody says the elevation change, right? But you know, that was obviously uh, incredible. You know, I didn't understand fully how how the elevation especially from the clubhouse down into amen corner how significant that elevation change was but i think you know as an architecture geek 14 green um, was one of the things that i wanted to go and spend some time standing looking at but really you know just being there for a day it was just taking it all in it was you know my heart of hearts i'm still a golf fan i'm a golf i'm an architecture nerd first and foremost but i love the game of golf and people who say oh do you go to the masters you know, to hobnob or socialize where I was like, actually, no, I go as a fan, right? Because we haven't had anything to do with the golf course. So it's not like I'm there studying or looking at anything, any of our work, like, you know, we're fortunate to do with some of the other major championships. So it's really just, hey, I want to watch these guys play golf and I want to see it on the grandest stage that the game has. So I think that was really the 
you know, being there with Gary was a lot of fun and just, we just took in as much golf as we could, um, but not primarily focusing on architecture, more the, the scale of the place. You know, Gil, you mentioned about the, these places that you've been entrusted uh, to, to restore to varying degrees. Many of them have hosted major championships recently, many more still to come in the, in the years uh, right in front of us. And, and when you think about the, the people responsible originally, Donald Ross, George Thomas, Perry Maxwell, A.W. Tillinghast, Seth Rayner, C.B. McDonald, William Flynn. You've done work on all of their golf courses. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think until you did Lake Merced you had done a McKenzie golf course. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Yeah, that was our – So, so what – you're look, you – you, yeah. Yeah, there's an asterisk on that. It was a McKenzie redo, not an original McKenzie, right. but we went, we went back to what he did when he came and redid the golf course. Okay. So, look, you're you're you try to understand as best you can about what the original intent was and obviously it was an original there. What were the things that that struck you about the work that he did uh at Lake Merced that that tickled you, that you loved, that you were enthralled by? Um yeah, I think the the biggest change for us as a team was was the bunkering, right? His the bunkering that he created at Lake Merced and in Cyprus, Pasa Tiempo, just the the beauty of it, the the complexity of the shapes and the forms and the connection and the third dimension between the edges and and the sand. And one of the things that you know we we Jim and I have learned a lot through the years is primarily about bunker building is from bill kittleman the old pro at marion and so marion usually informs the way we look at shaping bunkers right that big curvature in the sand the white faces of marion sort of thinner tops but the base of the, and be meaning the sand and the base of the bunker being really sturdy and a big upsweep almost like the base of a wave and then the crest of the wave being the top edge of it and when we studied McKenzie, it was much flatter in the sand. Like the bunkers almost just kind of laid at grade. They didn't have that big curve or cup in the face. And so we were about a hole or two into it. And Seamus Maley uh, ran the project for us out there and was doing most of the bunker shaping. And you know, he's obviously used to working with us for years and years and just kept saying, no, that's not right. That's not right. And it was like, we had to relearn in our brain how to shape the floor of a bunker to match much more of what McKenzie had had shaped out there. So that was really an interesting learning exercise. And then once we kind of hit our stride, I feel like we did a really good job representing his work. Um, but the, the simplicity of what he did, like he took a golf course, it was built by Willie Locke, had over 300 bunkers and he cut it down, you know, down at well under a hundred. And, but they, had a, they left an exclamation point in the landscape. Every one of them had a purpose, whether it was visual, whether it was strategic. And I think studying and learning that simplicity, and you hear a lot about that, you know, the he and Bobby Jones at Augusta National, you know, very few bunkers when it was first built. It was really more about landforms and simplicity and the landscape instead of overwhelming the landscape. So I think looking at how sparingly he used bunkers when he transitioned to golf course that was referred to as the pine valley of the west to what he created in the late 20s at lake merced it was it was a great learning exercise in restraint yet still capturing the high points like the you know the 13th hole the par three in the corner that you know we've talked an awful lot about just how he almost like used everything on that hole um, and then kind of went back to a much more restrained presentation. And I think that was an, an amazing lesson for us because I've always respected McKenzie more than any of the other architects because I think he seemed to be the first to really understand the connection between strategy, interest, quirk to a certain degree, and beauty. Like he created beautiful golf courses and they functioned beautifully from a strategic standpoint some of the other architects you know as they matured they they started to create more beautiful compositions but mckenzie just from like the start you know and they talk a lot about his background in camouflage and understanding how to set features in the ground and disguise them as to appear natural and i think 
that's one of the big lessons we learned at Lake Merced was that not only did he talk that, but he, he did it. And it was great from our perspective. The, um, and, and those, those types of bunkers, um, t- to me anyway, the application of that, what you've, what you've done at the park, what you've done at Ohoopi, what you've done at Caprock Ranch, what you've done at Stream Song Black, that, that kind of, that natural transition from, from the, 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 you know, the, the proper bunker to the natural areas, to the vegetation, um, like that to me is some of the best stuff that you've done. Um, because there is, it, there's a fraying, there's something about it that is just like, my God, this, okay, I want to think that this was always here, but it wasn't always here. But isn't that like the greatest objective to make people's belief being suspended to think there's no way they did this because it looks like it's always been here. Yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the highest compliments we can we can ever get. And, you know, that, again, is a testament to all the guys that work with us, all the cavemen and their talents and their abilities to, to shape creatively and well but i think it comes again back to bill kittleman you know the conversations that bill and jim and i have had over the years about that fraying you know they're talking about the i've used this analogy or bill's you know started with the, the tapestry right the that the core of these great old tapestries the everything's the fibers and the weaving is really tight and the colors are vibrant but you know over centuries as you get to the edges, they fray and fade. And then, and so that's a golf course, right? A golf course should be tight in the presentation through the center. But then as you get out to the edges, it frays and it merges back in with nature. And I think the bunker bunkering can be that perfect transition, right? Because you've got maintained edge and you've got sand and then you're going right into the native. So it allows you both from an elevation standpoint to tie back into a, a natural landform um, by use, you know, because you can make them steeper. So if you've got a steep slope, you can transition quite easily using sand, but it also provides that buffer between the green grass and the native stuff. If you went green, maintain turf right into bushes and shrubs, that's a very harsh transition. So you need to have sort of these layers of transitions. And I think Mackenzie did that so incredibly well at all of his golf courses. Now, Obviously, at Augusta National, there's very clean yeah. lines, which yeah. you know, are not really indicative of what he and Bobby Jones did originally. Um, but you know, it's one of those things where it's it's evolved to this point in time. And I'm not saying anyone would ever want to suggest that they change it. It's so iconic and it's so beautiful in its presentation. But when you look at the more raw examples of what Mackenzie did, Cypress Point, Pasta Tiempo, Royal Melbourne. You know, you start to see that more natural transition and and praying at the edges. The um, I, I've never asked you this. Have you ever been to All Woodley or Moortown? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, what explain to people that was his first foray into, you know, taking thoughts in his mind and applying it to to work on the ground. All Woodley, and then I, it was Moortown started with one hole. I believe that's correct. So I think Alt Woodley was where he met uh, Harry Colt. Um, Colt was uh, engaged. He was the secretary at Sunningdale and, you know, active in golf architecture. And he came to Alt Woodley where McKenzie was a member. Uh, those of you in the McKenzie Society, if I've got this wrong, I apologize. But I think it's pretty close to being right. Um, and and so he started, he was almost like uh, Colt's guy on the ground. Um, very much like what George Thomas did for Fowler at, at LACC, kind of the guy who was there locally and who could be in charge and sort of oversee and implement. And and I believe that Colt was just so impressed with McKenzie, had all these models of bunkers and everything. You kind of overwhelmed Colt with all this, with his enthusiasm for it. And then not far away was Moortown, which is where he did start out. Um, I'm not sure if he started with the reef hole there, or sorry, not the reef hole, um, I thought it was like what is now, I think, the 10th hole, the Gibraltar yes. hole. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I think it, it's one of those things where then he transitioned to a little bit more of a, a forward role at Moortown, was very much more involved with what was going on there. And then ultimately formed a partnership with Colt um, and, and Allison. And so for, I think, probably about an eight or 10 year period, they worked together until Mackenzie left and you know, came to the States to set up shop. What, what, you know, you mentioned Cypress Point and, and Pasa Tiempo, 
and, and to a large degree, what, what, what Bob Jones saw at Cypress Point, uh, he was captured by it, uh, which, which then created the momentum for the relationship for Augusta National. And here's the interesting thing about McKenzie. Among, among all those players, and it was to varying degrees, but the point is many of those Golden Age architects were really fine players, really fine players. He was not. Um, what was the benefit of the collaboration with Jones above and beyond the, you know, the idea of getting people interested in it because he was a, truly a rock star. He was his biggest star in, in this country, sports and culturally is really anybody. Um, beyond that though, what was the biggest benefit to those two minds collaborating? I mean, it's just conjecture on my part, but you know, a lot of really accomplished golfers see the game through their their own eyes, right? The way they play the game, right? And but they have a difficult time visualizing landforms and how you could translate that into the ground until there's something shaped or roughed out in front of them. Then they have something to react to, as they're just walking through. You know, in that case, a, a nursery. It would have been difficult and um, you know bobby jones was exceptional in many ways maybe he was exceptional in the fact that he could actually visualize stuff in the in the raw ground but i think the combination of the two the great mind the creativity of mckenzie and his ability to get into you know, blending the built with the natural and understanding those aspects of it and jones with the mind and the strategic aspect of what creates great golf in his opinion. And then the fact that the two of them were perfectly aligned in their love for the old course, St. Andrews. So you walk around a property, you've got a guy who can visualize things in the raw. You've got a guy who can articulate at the highest level and play at the highest level, what challenges and excites him. And so you would think that the merging of those minds would create something spectacular, which they did. Uh, yeah, I'll never forget the first time I asked you the question of where your greatest inspiration could come if I put you on the first tee anywhere and you just walked. Uh, we were sitting in the clubhouse at Streamsong before you were getting ready to embark on the Black Project. And, and you said, you said, of course, it's the old course. I mean, it's just and, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and they were the same way. And it has been pointed out constantly and repeatedly for, for generations that Augusta National, the inspiration did come from the old course. Today, what what about it? Because again, the presentation is so different, but what at its core do you think is is still true to what they intended to possibly take from there and apply it in Augusta, Georgia? Well, I think it's it's the options, it's the angles, it's the, the ability. Um, you know, we've had this conversation before about the best golf architecture means that the ability to play a golf course, you know, the level of precision, just to literally go out and play, is fairly low, right? If you can just hit it here, hit it there, knock it around and find it and hit it again. Uh, but the level of precision required to score is high. And that's the old course, particularly if the wind is blowing. And it's Augusta without a doubt. I mean, we see that every April, you know, with the whole locations they select and the green speeds and and the angles and the, you know, wide fairways. But you really need to be on the proper side of the fairway to attack and the slopes and, and all of the things that combine to make you literally have to hit very, very precise golf shots to score out there. Same thing in St. Andrews. And again, the wind always has to be a present, right? Given the way the game is played now, if the wind's not blowing, St. Andrews doesn't have as, as high a degree of precision required, but the wind is should and usually is a constant factor. And that, you know, amps the level of precision required up higher. So I think from that standpoint, when you combine those elements, that's really at the core of Augusta National. It's more of a philosophical presentation as opposed to mimicking or copying you know it's not that like they built, went out and built template holes they just at its core those principles permeate all the way through the old course and they permeate all the way through augusta national and i'm certain that they talked about different shots and different ways to play and the green complexes you know one of the beautiful things about augusta national is that the land you know with the exception of some of the mounding on hole number eight and some of the mounds that you find around the golf course is beautifully presented and it's so natural 
And then you get to these green complexes and they are complicated. And, you know, if you really look closely, they are somewhat detached from the landforms, yet they're so well blended. And, you know, you look at some of the, like, it's sides of number one green, right? If you were to say, okay, trace a line from the natural landscape on both sides of it, there's a lot going on in between there. Um, but then you look at 14, which is one of the greatest creations ever put together, and you look at how it blends in so beautifully on the left-hand side. But the right-hand side is bolstered by this huge mound, and because the scale of that mound is such that it, it lends itself to feel natural. So there again, I know Maxwell shaped that green, but you know his teachings from the standpoint of McKenzie, it's that feeling of how do we blend and merge things together. So they they kept the vast majority of the property natural and when they had to create features they did so in a way that they blend but not perfectly but that may have been more the focus on strategy and precision it's like okay in order for us to create these whole locations that are going to be difficult to get at we have to actually go ahead and move and create landforms uh you you mentioned maxwell so so perry maxwell um had you know, he, he did work with McKenzie, Crystal Downs, uh, University, of Michigan golf, University of Michigan golf course. He was, he was prominent uh, in both of those projects to begin with. Um, his work at Augusta National wasn't long after it was opened that McKenzie, you know, of course, he, he was gone uh, immediately. But, but you mentioned 14. Take us through Seven Green. And, and, and the changes made to 10 because that green originally butted up against the McKenzie bunker and how dramatic and, and significant the change to move it to where it currently is now. Just the Maxwell influence on Augusta National. Well, I think one of the, one of the you know, obviously the sad thing is that McKenzie passed and, and he wasn't involved in this, but, you know, almost without exception, almost every golf course goes through a period of, of study and, and ultimately, you know, reviews that say, hey, did we miss something here? Can we do something better? And having Bobby Jones there as a constant presence for decades um, allowed them to have a tie to the origins of the golf course so that any time, like in the 50s, when Trent Jones came in and made some alterations there, there was always one constant, and it was Bobby Jones. So from the standpoint of, obviously, we don't know how that decision was made to revisit, you know, 14, 7, 10, how, do, how did that happen? But the fact that he had this, you know, the foresight to say, all right, we're going to go and work, get somebody who worked with McKenzie, who understood McKenzie, who understood the, what he might have ultimately created. Um, and then obviously still having the presence of Jones there, they, they made some changes which improved the golf course. Right. It was one of those things where uh, 10, I, I don't think anyone can argue that that's a better green, you know, a worse green site than what they had down below just beyond the bunker. I think the fact that they decided to keep the bunker in the middle of the fairway was really interesting. <laughs> um, it would have loved to have been a fly on the wall to say, you know, okay, we're going to move the green, but we're still going to keep that bunker. You know, why? Um, what was the thought process behind that? Um, obviously, seven being a much shorter hole back then, um, you know, a green, greens within a green like the little bowl down there on the right and so yeah, the right hand side, uh, the different hole locations, the shelf in the middle, just the, the level of precision, which we talked about earlier. Um, maybe no other green on the golf course has that um, in, in the different compartments. And then you get 14 in the scale and the scope and the, dare I say, audacity of, of that green. And, you know, we talk about waves, um, you know the, the the front of that green just is is, is marvelous and <laughs> its composition the false front the way it goes up onto the plateau and then you've got the different hole locations which we've all come to know so well over the years so i think the creativity shown well 10 green isn't the most creative it could possibly be the most frightening um you, you know you hear them talk about being above the pin being below you know, all those sorts of things um the green the location is amazing but the green itself and it could have very well been one of those things where and i think these architects understood this perfectly is either the shot requirements or just listen the setting is so spectacular up here on this ridge we don't need to overdo this one 
we don't, you know, it just can sit up here perfectly because the green side is wonderful in and of itself. So we don't need to go in and create a green that's got all kinds of drama in it itself. So I think combination of those things, obviously, uh, you know, an incredible lasting presence uh, at Augusta National as far as Perry Maxwell is concerned. You know, the, the McKenzie bunker to me, Gil, is it's the, the edges are, are sharp and they're clean. But to me, it's that's kind of like the homage to him, because if you look at it from the sky, it has it's not homogenous. It's 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 the closest thing to what you know his imagination was when it came uh, to that type of design feature. So again, so the edges are sharp and they're clean. I think it's one of the most spectacular features anywhere in the world, especially if you're standing at the top of the hill on 10 and you just, I, I, honestly, I can stand there and I can look at it, not for, for you know, an hour, but I could suspend myself there for a little bit. Yeah. Absolutely. You no, know, and it, and then scale wise has a great presence and it sits, you know, it's, it's interesting because you've got, it sort of serves as the transition in the flattish ground. Like you've got this big hill coming down and then you've got the climb up to the green and almost like, you know, and I wonder if that was part of the conversation. If we take this out, it's going to feel fairly mundane down in that big low area. And the, it kind of serves as a really nice exclamation point in that, uh, in the in the land of that 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 hole sits on, you know, probably the most boring part of the of the ground. Let me get your thoughts on on two holes and then two greens, and and then we'll let you go. Um, twelve and thirteen. Every time I go there and I look at twelve, part of it is that there's nothing behind there. They don't allow spectators behind it, so it really is like a stage, and it's and it's. You know, for all intents and purposes, it almost kind of looks like an open field. Um, and it's 150 yards, and they've been having to manipulate yardage through the... It just, it is what it is. Why is it so good? It's the angle, right? It's the way the green sits. It, it, it appears from the tee that it's sitting directly across from you. But, you know, we all know that it's tilted in a way, the way it runs. Um, it's just you know, it's half a club <laughs> wrong and you're in trouble. Right. And so I think from that standpoint, it's just whether he understood that, I think he did um, to how, and we've, Jim and I have implemented that in a lot of our designs on shortish par threes, you know, to say, listen, let's just change the, just so that the carry number is just enough that, okay, I'm safe. If I go left, if I go right with that number, I'm done. Okay, so now what do I need to hit to go right? Okay, to be safe going that way. And now if I pull it a little bit, I'm done. So it's one of those things that really throws you into um, into a difficult situation, right? And it's it was interesting um, when they were talking about you know, the left-handed versus right-handed players and how you know the carries a little. It just sets up better for a left-hander because if you're going to pull it. You're going to go, you know, a little bit longer, and that's where you need it a little bit longer. If you're going to cut it, you're going to go a little bit shorter, and that's where it works out. But for the right-handed golfer, it's just the opposite, and that's why we see that happen so much. You get a little gust, and you know, we all know that the golf gods play or play some tricks down in that corner. And I think so. The brilliance, the setup. I mean, again, the putting green itself isn't diabolical. I mean, you obviously have to pay attention because of the speeds, but it's just all about that angle and that tilt. And if you look at the bunkering behind the green, that's probably the one place on the property where we get some fraying. Mm. You know, you've got the yeah. sort of ivy or whatever's growing up on that hillside ground cover coming down in. And I think that's a beautiful composition that obviously everyone's focused on the race creek and the green and the bunker in front. But, you know, maybe this time when you're watching it, People who are listening, when you're watching the 12th hole, take a look at the bunkering behind the green. It really is beautiful. Uh, 13, uh, speaking of kind of diagonal, the tributary and the way that it is set up, you know, you, you look at what is theoretically a back pin, but it looks like it's more right because, again, you're, you're having to cross more. There is more that you're challenging yourself from. And also the tilt of the land itself. Um, just walk us through your thoughts about that hole, which many could argue is the most famous hole in the world because of 
the gravity of what has transpired there through the generations. Yeah, it's, you know, it's one of those half par holes. And, you know, we've got another year now to look at, at with the new tee and see kind of what. Yeah, last it year wasn't fair. It was wet the whole week. It was not a fair exactly. examination. So it'll be interesting to see this year how that how that works out. Um, but I think it's yeah, it's brilliant. It's it's all about angles and slopes. It's everything we've we've talked about and the precision required to to hit these things and play different types of shots because of the ground, you know, the the severe tilt of the fairway in that area. Obviously, the presence of Race Creek and how it meanders down the left and then crosses over to the right in front of the green. I mean, it is. It's just a bit. You know, you'd think you'd like to think that if you're ever given a piece of ground like that, you'd figure that out because <laughs> it's just so good. And it's just and, and as you said, the you know, the gravity of it, especially on Sunday, you know, you know, you've got basically two really good chances to make birdie possible eagle on 13 and 15. We just come through the toughest stretch of the golf course. Um, and now here you are with this sort of do or die type shot. And, and it's you have to be precise. And the green itself requires that as well. I mean, you can, you know, you can miss in bad spots on that green and three putting is, you know, is really going to be a, a, not, not a happy result, but a realistic result. If you're not, if you get yourself out of position or if you miss up in the swale. So I think there's, there's all kinds of outcomes there that, that weigh on the fact that there's the expectation that you're going to make four at the worst. And then you walk off of it making five, and now you're really upset, even though you just made par, you make six, God forbid. You know, now you're so the swings that can happen there are also an incredible part of it. You know, a three jump starts somebody, puts them right back in contention. Uh, you know, a five is a huge disappointment. So I think from those standpoints, uh, the, the psychological aspect of that golf hole and where it's placed in the round of golf is perfect, and the golf hole itself is perfect. Yeah, I, I'm telling you, and it's going to happen again this year. They they use that, you know, kind of back right pin on Sunday. And naturally, you're going to have a lot of balls that go past it on second shots. And the number of putts that I have seen in the 40-plus years I've been watching it of guys thinking there's more pull left uh, to that particular pin, and it's, for whatever reason, it's it's straighter from behind the hole, you know, 15, 18, 20 feet. And the number of guys who extend their hand, like, how did that, that go more? I mean, I just, again, there's so much there to examine. Let me get your thoughts on two greens before I let you go, because you've already talked about 14, which is, to me, art. Um, three green. Um, just a thought about, I think, again, you have to go there, and you can't get close enough to see how treacherous especially like front left uh, and yeah you got a short club in your hand but nonetheless um just your thoughts about about the third green to begin with well i think uh jim and i paid it the ultimate compliment where we we didn't copy it directly but we you we it inspired us greatly uh on pga frisco on the east course so in 27 you'll see or 20, 20 next year you'll see the ladies uh tackle a hole very similar i mean the the rest of the hole isn't exactly the same, but the green complex is very similar. In 27, you'll see the men uh, tackle that as well. So it's obviously been hugely influential and impressive to, to Jim and I that we'd go to that length to to try to replicate it to a certain degree. You're right. It's it's all about control into that, that pin. And the fact that some players lay up, some players bomb it. Um, standing down below that green you can't believe how high above your head it is number one and then and how narrow that shelf is on the left to try to hit whether you skip something up there get it to stop do you try and fly something up there just i love watching players on on you know the, i think it's the shortest part four on the golf course with the wheels just constantly spinning they're turning as what should we do what should i hit and then, you know, the right-hand side, the extension that goes back, there's so much cross slope from right to left that, you know, you see them play it up above and it spins down below. And then that's another putt. They never seem to be able to read when they come back up. And God forbid you leave it up above, you know, and you've got that curl. I mean, the curling on that putt is, is, is amazing. And so, you know, a lot of the focus gets put on that left-hand shelf and appropriately so because of the tight place you're hitting into, but the cross slope on the right-hand side of that green, 
uh, causes the players to fits as well. So when you get a hole of that length that asks a lot of questions off the tee, where do I want to put myself in order to go into that green? And then asks another really compelling question with how do I get it into the proper section of that green? I think that that's, you know, that's the best you can do with a short par four. Hole number five, uh, I recommend people, if, if you want to read a book about a great historical perspective on the Masters, David Owen's book, The Making of the Masters, and one of the things he points out was how arduous the process was to, to build that hole. Um, and the road hole, there was, you know, there was certainly thoughts from, from Jones and McKenzie in terms of the way it was constructed and designed. But the green itself, again, similar to 14, you just go, oh my God, like, look at, look at what exists here. Um, your thoughts on the fifth green? Yeah, I mean, it's like you said, similar to 14, there's, there's a lot of green that you're looking at that doesn't serve any purpose from a, I mean, it serves a huge purpose from the standpoint of rejecting shots and pulling them back off, but you never get a whole location on it. So you're standing there looking at this big false front and you're thinking, wow, that's a pretty good sized green. And then you realize the part of the green that you actually have to hit to that, that a ball will stay up on the shelf that you need to. I'm always fascinated by that sort of left-hand shelf when they put the pins up there and you've got the bunker over the back and just, it's so tight. And with the, the additional length to the golf hole um, and players, you know, steering clear of the bunkering down the left-hand side with a little bit longer club coming into there, you know, it all gets back to that level of precision. It's just, it's an incredibly difficult shot to hit. And I can only imagine the reward, the feeling, the rewarding feeling of actually pulling it off. And then you got to get up there and hit putts that seem to, again, defy logic as to which way they break, you know, and, and, and it's always that green seems to provide an awful lot of head scratchers as well. Um, when the guys are standing there and they hit a putt and they feel like they've hit a good one and it just doesn't quite turn the way that they think it should. But from a, a composition standpoint, uh, again, it's, it's, I believe it's an understanding and appreciation of scale in what you're presenting to the golfer and the way they're looking at it from out in the fairway and the relationship of, of that false front and the size of it in relation to the elevation change that it brings on, right? I mean, on, on the 17th, on the road hole on the old course, it's a fairly abrupt up uh, onto the upper shelf that runs behind the road hole bunker. Here, it's got much more of a sort of a big, long flow to it. And I feel like the scale of this matches the elevation change really very, very nicely. It's not too abrupt, it's, but it's abrupt enough that it's going to reject a shot, but it just feels more in concert. Whereas, you know, the road hole, that's just what was there, right? It wasn't like somebody created that shelf and said, okay, this is how we're going to divide and, and make the elevation change. Whereas Mackenzie and Jones had to physically you know, stand there and say, all right, listen, what is the relationship both in the depth of it and the height of it that we want to present to the golfer to create the effect of that false front? And as they did with the rest of the property, they just nailed it. Listen, uh, you're you're at work, you're in your office, you're awfully kind to, to <laughs> take the time. Uh, I look forward to seeing you. Of, of all the people who will be on the grounds at Augusta National this year, who will you will think will be taking in a lot of golf shots, but actually he'll be looking beyond whoever's hitting the shot at something, some landform, some <laughs> <laughs> it's you. Yeah, well, it'll be me. Uh, I'll, I always enjoy it. It's it's fun. It's, you know, having grown up in the Northeast and living in the Northeast, it's the start of golf season, yes. right? It's, it's spring. It's, it's uh, everything exciting about the game of golf, especially in this day and age. Uh, we get to actually sit back and, and talk about what we should really be talking about and focusing on, which is uh, amazing architecture, uh, amazing stage for the game of golf and watching the best players in the world take it on. Thanks as always. Thanks, Gary. Always enjoy it. Be well. Really appreciate Gil taking the time. I know that you appreciate all the things that he said. There's a lot of nuance to that. Uh, there's a lot of nerding out on land and land forms. But if you go to the Masters this year, think about some of the things that he said, in particular about three green and five green, uh, the McKenzie bunker on 10, the 14th green. 
And I would tell you, I have favorite places on every single hole. And I highly recommend, like, go out at the turning point on 13 and look back at 12 green and look at 13 T. And yes, take time to look at, at 14 green, but also stand up on the top of the hill on six and see the proximity of that to the 16th green, to the 17th, to the 13th green. The confluence of so many things there that you don't necessarily get if you're just watching it on television. And a lot of you, you know, maybe you haven't been there, but it is, uh, it's really something to see. And most importantly, I appreciate all of you listening to my conversation with Gil. Masters Week is about upon us. The design preview. We'll see you next time right here on Five Clubs.